Uh, welcome to the Enfield Town Council special meeting. Today is Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. Uh, budget discussions. We will be hearing the library and social services tonight. Sheila, roll call. Councillor Bosco is absent. Deputy Mayor Sakala Here. Mayor Crisati? Here. Councillor Despard is absent. Councillor Finger? Here. Councillor Hopkins? Here. Councillor Ludwig? He's here remotely. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Mangini? Here. He's here re remotely. Uh, Councillor Pisner? Here. Councillor Santanella? Here. And Councillor Ungeyer is absent. That's eight members present and three absent. Okay, welcome, Jason. Thank you. Floor is yours. Okay, so um, to kind of go through the budget, what I'm going to do is um, go through sort of line by line on the changes that were made. Um, so, um, you know, as an overview, um, the the non personnel piece of uh, the budgets for the library and senior center came in flat, so they they are zero. Um, and recreation actually had a slight decrease of $2,704, um, and that is largely due to the closure of the La Mania pool. And I'll get into all the details on that. So um, as far as uh, the admin division, uh, we originally had three people in that, uh, myself, Mary Keller, and Katie Worth. They were the deputy directors of the uh, department. Last March, when um, Sheila Grady left the senior center, we did a little reorg, and uh, Mary Keller was put in charge of the senior center exclusively. Um, Katie, who is the dec is the deputy director of libraries, has no real over. She doesn't oversee either recreation or the senior center, so we moved her back down into the library division. So right now, the the admin division is just myself, um, as well as I think the workers comp for the the division. Um, so that was a completely cost-neutral move. So I just wanted you to be aware of that because it's going to show that the admin went down significantly and then there's a commensurate um, raise in the, the library one. So uh, sort of line by line on the library side, um, we are going to restore the pre-pandemic programming funds. Uh, so that's going uh, back up to $10,000 in professional services. Uh, copying, we are actually, we have a savings of $1,600, and that's due to the a and contract that we have. Um, they service all the copy machines. Travel is going up a little bit as we um, begin the post, hopefully post-pandemic uh, outreach that we had been doing. And instructional supplies were boosting by about $300, um, and that is because over at Pearl Street, we're going to be doing more programming. Um, Amy Sixt has been doing a wonderful job over there as the branch librarian. Uh, so we want to give her some, some funds to uh, expand what she's doing. Publications and periodicals has decreased, and I anticipate in the future it will continue to, to decrease as more and more periodicals are ceasing publication. So that's a trend that we've noticed. Uh, book rebinding is sort of an old line. We don't, we haven't actually rebound materials in quite some time. Uh, that was largely for periodicals. Um, in the last few years, we've been using it to assist with the digitization of the Enfield Press. Uh, the Enfield Press has ceased publication, so that's a line that we're actually going to be eliminating. And the furniture's gone down $3,000, and that is largely because we had a $3,000 mid-year increase because of um, a grant that we received from the state library that we used for some furniture. Senior Center, um, there are actually no significant budgetary changes at all this year. Um, so our goal with the Senior Center this year is really going to be getting the programming and everything back to what the, the levels we were at before the pandemic. Um, with REC, there were quite a few changes. Um, one is the part-time salaries uh, due to minimum wage and then the wage creep. That is um, an increase over last year. And then something else I'm going to touch on it towards the end. The field trips, um, we're going to reduce by $4,215. Uh, the Major League Baseball field trips have not proven as popular as we had hoped. It seems like whenever the Red Sox or the Yankees are in the World Series, there's a, a big increase in interest, and that has sort of dwindled. Plus, we have to buy all the tickets up front and then hope that we can sell them. So it's probably not a great model. 
Um, other professional services, um, whenever we moved from, um, it's escaping me now, but the platform that we had used for registration to MyREC, um, there was a significant savings on that. Um, a lot of those savings we rolled into additional um, contracted uh, programs, so we're going to try to expand that this year. And even after doing that, there was still $848 in savings. Student transportation, um, that is a reduction because, frankly, it was over budgeted last year for the number of student field trips um, that, was, that were taking place through Camp Tons of Fun. Uh, telephone, whenever we moved to the new uh, space over at the annex, uh, we didn't need one of the phones, so that's a decrease. Postage is $300 down just because we're sending out less mail through REC. Um, copying supplies are just more expensive, there's, so there's an increase there. Safety supplies, we just need to rebuild some of the stock of first aid um, equipment and supplies that we have. And athletic supplies is also a reduction, and that's due to the Lamagna pool closing. Uh, uniforms, we've uh, sort of, in the last year, we have um, taken over for uh, travel basketball. So there is an increase in the uh, uniform line. And that is ultimately recouped in the fees that we charge for the programs. Um, the dues, fees, and subscriptions. Uh, we had originally budgeted uh, funds for the Travel Basketball League, but because we actually host the playoff games, those fees are waived, so it's not an expense that we need to budget for. And then the biggest reduction is $30,000 um, due to the closing of the Lamagna pool. Um, all that said, swim lessons, the Dolphin swim team, swimming at camp, tons of fun, and weekend open swim will all be continuing at the annex pool. Um, so that's just us moving the, the, the funds around. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to, yeah. Through that. Go ahead. Thank you, Councilor Hopkins. Um, what are some of the, so that's a you know, $30,000 decrease because of the pool. What are some of the costs that go into the aquatics uh, line item that you had there that are not now uh, going to be used? So a lot of that's staffing. Um, so we had to staff um, the Lamagna pool, lifeguards, um, gate staff, and then um, you know some uniforms, so the the um, the swim suits that we would provide, that kind of stuff. But it's mainly personnel. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And then in addition to the um, the flat budget that I put together, I do have some proposals that I would like you to entertain. Um, the the biggest one is has to do with personnel. Um, Whenever Mary went to the senior center, we lost a lot of administrative support for both the senior center and recreation because she did a, she sort of did a lot for both of those divisions. Um, so with the elimination of the deputy director position, um, they're in a situation where they just are really thin as far as administrative supervisory and programming uh, support. So we have two very capable individuals at the senior center and the recreation department um, that are in program coordinator positions. And what we'd like to do is assign them more supervisory and programming duties. Um, the senior center program coordinator, we would like to retain the same title because it's sort of the industry standard. So if the incumbent leaves and we post that job, it's going to, that, that's the job title that people will be expecting. Um, so we're proposing to take it from 40,315 up to 50, um, and we would work with HR to update the job description. On the recreation side, we would take the program coordinator and change that to rec supervisor. Um, and once more, that would, if the incumbent leaves, that is the position that would be equivalent in most communities. So that would go from uh, 42,329 to 52,329. Um, now with the savings from the pool, um, we have $10,000 already earmarked in personnel to cover some of that. Uh, so all we would need is an additional $8,032 to actually make these changes. So that is the first one. On the library side, um, Ebooks and e-downloadable audiobooks have really taken off in popularity. 
Um, I did some looking back, and over the last six years, there's been a 150% increase in circulations of these materials. Um, just in the last year alone, with the pandemic, it went up, uh, I think it was 16%. Um, now, one of the, the drawbacks is, as we purchase the materials, what we're doing is purchasing a license to circulate it. So it's basically one user, one checkout at a time. So with our physical collection, if James Patterson or a very popular author puts out a new book, we're often buying multiple copies to meet the, the immediate demand. So we would like to raise that budget by an additional $2,550, and that would be to purchase duplicate copies of popular titles to try to shorten up the, the hold queues that we have. Uh, the other thing that we've noticed with the pandemic is a decrease in the number of new library card registrations. Um, it actually went down 36% from FY19 to 21. Um, we have access to a database at the library, uh, Reference USA, and one of the features of this is you can see the um, new households moving into a community, and this is both homeowners and renters. Um, so in looking at that, we found that 17, um, 1,719 new households have moved in. Um, and we can also get access to those addresses through this database. So what we would like to do is send out postcards uh, demonstrating exactly what we offer at the library and let them know we're here. Um, and encourage them to come down, get a library card, and see what we're all about. Um, along those lines, we had uh, someone stop in today um, who recently moved into town. He's actually a, um, a, a player for the Springfield Thunderbirds, and he was interested in learning an instrument, musical instrument. So he found out that we've got this musical instrument lending library, came down and checked out a keyboard. So that's the kind of thing we want to see more of in the community um, and really start to raise those numbers back up. And we think this is one way to do it. Um, we have an excess in postage for this year, so we've begun mailing them out to folks that have moved in over the last year. Uh, yesterday was the first day we actually sent them out. Um, it will be, we're estimating about one, an additional $1,020 to do this for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and the, the good thing is we're going to be able to measure the impact of this. So we, we see what the trend has been. And if the only variable we're changing is this outreach, we're going to be able to tell if it works. And if it doesn't, we can you know, abandon it next year. But it's something we want to try. And then uh, the, the last thing I want to propose is uh, going fine free at the library. There's been a, a, a big movement over the course of the last two to three years where libraries are going fine free. And this is for overdue fines, um, not for, you know, if someone brings a book back that's trashed or they lose something, they'll still be responsible for that. Um, but a, a little more than half of the libraries in Connecticut have, have done this recently. Um, and overdue fines are incre increasingly seen as an equity issue that disproportionately impacts lower income uh, families. Um, ALA is strongly in support of this and have written numerous articles talking about going in this direction. Um, you know, from throughout the pandemic, the first year of it, from March 2020 to the uh, June 21, we actually waived overdue fines, and we saw absolutely no change in the amount of items that were coming back late. Um, so the other thing that I want to point out is the fines that we've collected have been all over the map over the course of the last few years. FY20, it was... Uh, almost $4,900. Uh, during the pandemic, we collected all of $453. And so far this year, we've done $2,161. Um, so as I said, we're, we're going to continue to charge for anything that's damaged um, or you know just hasn't been returned. And we would keep them for certain items that are time sensitive and getting back. So the museum passes are one example. We have people waiting for those, and we need to get those back immediately. Um, the friends at the library have paid for those. They paid a lot of money for those. So we want to make sure that the community can best enjoy it. And even things like we've got a, a special subsection of books um, that 
they're, they're considered express titles. So again, the James Pattersons, the David Baldacci ones that come out that people are waiting for, we would probably continue to charge fines for those because the, the, the intent of that is you get it for a week, you read it, you get it back so the next person can get it. So those are some of the things we'd like to do. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, Councillor Pizner. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be so so. If they say okay, you don't have to pay a fine. What would be the incentive for them to ever bring the book back? They would be charged for it. So they're going to get if, a bill in the mail. Absolutely. Yeah. And what are the chances of getting the money for that bill? Um, I would say that's probably about as good as collecting the overdue fine. If they want to continue to use the library, because whenever you get more than ten dollars in charges on your library card. You're, you're cut off. You can't use any of the services. I mean, I have no problem with taking a fine away on a child's book because if the mother is lax or dad is lax or whatever sure. and bringing the book back, but I think adult books, if you borrow a book from the library, it should come back because that's just being responsible for the next person waiting for it. Sure. So I'll be honest with you, I, I, I fine with the children's because mm -hmm. that's, but I would have a problem with taking the fine away on adult books. I, I just would. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Scala. So along that same lines, when does a late book become a lost book? I believe it's three weeks after the due date. So, and you would still charge for lost books? Absolutely. But not late books? Absolutely. Ah, that's yeah. fine with me. No, we, we, we need the material back. No, right, right, right. Yeah, but if you're just talking a couple of weeks, then ah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Councilor Franker. So Jason, these people who like the fines and stuff, and you don't allow them to use the library, but isn't our library in a structure of like with other libraries to where now they can't go to those other libraries to get the books because we're all like a, you can go online and get a book from Windsor Locks and we turn it in. in so if, you know what I'm saying? If your account is blocked and it's in our consortium, um, and there's roughly 30 libraries in our consortium, so from basically Enfield down to Middletown and then out from the rivers. Um, so if an Enfield patron, if they have more than $10 in fines, they would not be able to check anything out at any of those libraries. And conversely, if someone from Middletown has their card blocked, they couldn't check anything out in Enfield. So that means it's not just the Enfield library, it's that whole chain of libraries Correct. that yes. they'd be restricted from using that. Correct. No, I agree with that. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just make one comment in regard to the fines. Um, I think the intent and purpose of what you're saying is if somebody's late a couple of days on a fine, if they're a week late, maybe even two weeks, they might be away and they haven't given their book. I, I, have, I have no issues with that. Hearing you say that if it's a long extended period of time or if they lost that book, they would still be responsible for it. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm good with that. And to, to hear... Uh, that they would not be able to enter department, use the libraries from other towns because of overdue fees. They would be blocked on that. That's that's perfectly fine. Okay, I have no issues with that. Yep, Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had one question, one comment. I guess I'll start with a comment. Um, Actually, no, let me take that back. Two questions, one comment. <laughs> comment is, um, I, I think, I mean, I've, I've reviewed the American Library Association study on this and seen some stuff, you know, perks of having a wife who's a librarian. But um, it's interesting. The question, first question is, could you be able to send that around? I'm sure you have that and reviewed that, the ALA's study, just sure. to the, maybe to the town manager, just to kick me with the council. What's up? Can't wait to read it. Yes, well, it is interesting, and it does provide, and the, the key thing for me is that, you know, it provides, um, it provides some, uh, some interesting data behind this idea. Sure. Um, and my last question is, uh, what, what, do you know what amount of money you spend yearly on enforcement for collection of fines? Because that might be a, a part of this calculation as well. If you're not taking the time to do that, is that additional hours could be spent on something else? <laughs> That's a, okay. Um, so we, a, as an example, um, someone had checked out quite a few DVDs from the Pearl Street Library, um, and it was a significant amount that had, again, gone to that build status, because it had been more than three weeks, and it kicked over to that. 
Um, and, you know, I, I've worked with Chief Fox to determine, you know, th this is a significant amount of money we're looking at. And he said, well, it's, it's technically larceny in the whatever degree. Um, and by writing a friendly letter to the individual, say, stating that, you know, this is technically larceny and I'd really rather not get the police department involved, but it is something we would do to recover town property, um, all the stuff came back. Um, so it was a very effective way to, to do it, and it's, it's good that we've got a police department that's interested in helping us out with that. That's great. Councilor Santanella. So, Jason, it, if I have a, if I take out a book, don't return it, and the fine is $5, $3, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to forgive that, but I never give the book back, and you're sending me a bill. Yep. Are you replacing that book? So what we do is we take a look at the title. Um, so if it was a, um, I don't know, a, a book on World War II that was published in 1973, chances are we're not going to replace it with that exact copy, that exact title. We're going to get something newer and more relevant, unless it was a classic. So I mean, what, some of the tools that we have at the library um, are these very large books that talk about the, the, the core collection that most libraries should have. Um, so if it doesn't fall within there and it's that old, we're going to replace it with something newer. Um, if it's a, you know, an Ernst Hemingway book that we need to have on the shelf, we're absolutely going to replace that book. Right, so you see my point. So if we're not going to collect the fine and enforce that and people know they can just keep the book, mm -hmm. taxpayers are they going to have to replace the book at some higher value, right? No, but if it's lost for... If the person, if you put your billing somebody, you may not get reimbursed for the cost of the book, and now taxpayers have to replace the cost of the full book. Again, we're not talking millions of dollars here, but it adds up and it does kind of defeat the purpose of having a community library where people are supposed to have a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. You take what you want, and then you return it, and some so the next person can have it. If people are given an opportunity not to do that, we then have to replace those materials. Sure, and. I, so I just I feel like there's there's a little bit of inequity there if we're having to replace materials because people know they are, there's no consequence for them not returning it. Well, right. the, the the consequences they, other than not they, using the library, but the purpose of the library is so that the next person can enjoy sure. that material. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> anything that doesn't come back, they are billed for, um, and we, we certainly hope that they will pay that bill. Um, the 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 overdue fines I think are. I think in the, the past it's been seen as sort of the stick to make sure, it, you know, if your book's due on the 21st, you get it back on the 21st. Um, you know, if it's three days late, you're going to have 30 cents in fines. Um, if you never bring the book back, I mean, you've got the bill in addition to the, the maximum amount, amount of fine. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, another question that I have is, um, our, our our kids have really gone through a rough couple of years in school, right? Mm -hmm. And I think when you talk to people uh, in the Board of Ed or teachers, there's a lot of catching up that needs to be done, yep. right? And I'm just wondering, have you, has there been any discussions about how the library can become uh, uh, or offer services to kids who might need some extra help, some extra services, kind of filling the gap? Because I know on the on the education side, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to think about those ways, and I'm just wondering, has there been any discussions about how our libraries can fill help fill some of that need? You know, uh, other than the outreach that we're currently doing, so every every fourth grader in the town of Enfield comes to the library to to see the resources we have, get a library card if they don't already have one, and and learn how the library works. Um, I know that tutors often come and use the library in the evenings, um, both libraries. Um, but as, as far as a specific program to sort of catch kids up, I, I would need to look into that. I frankly don't know that I've got the staffing to mm -hmm. dedicate exclusively to that. Yeah, and I wasn't implying that this is something that mm -hmm. you solely should take on. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm just thinking about our facilities mm -hmm. and alternate uses and some needs yeah. that are arising in the community and is there 
have there been any discussions about um, meeting those needs? Um, I, I don't think there have been any specific discussions, okay. but like I said, tutors are often in using those spaces. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, uh, Councillor Ludwig. Mike? Yeah, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I'll be, I'll be real quick. Jason, how you doing? Good. So, Jason, I just want to make sure I'm clear. To, for, to generate um, you know, the library card, you know, is there any thought to actually proactively sending it out? You know, when, they, you know, when someone buys a property or, you know, is there a way we could, you know, as a, I don't know, a way we could actually proactively send it out? I've, I've put a little bit of thought into that. Um, a couple things that immediately come to mind. Um, number one, if, if it's a minor, we need the parents' approval right, for that. Right. So that's that's one of the things. Um, what about a family card? So you take care of it all in one fell swoop. Yeah, it, I'd be all for it. You know, I, I I hear you. I would love to see us be able to generate. Why not go on the offense if you feel that's the right way to do it? I, I like the idea. I would have to take a look and see exactly what the logistics of that would be. Um, yep. And if it drives more people to the library, I think it's a great idea. Um, I agree. I agree. It's a great, it's a great service, service, and anything we can do to make, get people to use it, I, I think, uh, you know, just throwing out an idea out for you. And real, just my only question, the 2500 curious, so if, if, if Book X was out, so a new book comes on the shelf, it's, you know, a lot of people want to read it. It's whatever. It's someone goes in and takes it. What's usually what's the wait time currently? And then so how do you? What's the goal to to, to sort of? My guess is you're going to spend that money to reduce, obviously reduce wait time and be able to give more people the same sort of book that everyone wants to read. Yep. Is that the goal? That's definitely the goal. Um, so yeah. with the physical books, uh, you know, we're able to meet that demand pretty readily. Right. With the e-books, got it. Um, I'll be honest. There, some of the some of the titles you might have a three to six month wait. Really, so it's wow. it's it's ugly. Yeah. No, I appreciate. Yeah, I've heard some of that too. So, yeah, I, I think it's a very good idea. And I, I was just it's good to know. Sort of, uh, you know, wait three months to read a book. Interesting. Yeah. No, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Councillor Santanella, it's me again. <laughs> uh, I just following up. So, how did? Just educate me a little bit on how these ebooks work. Mm -hmm. You get a license, yep. and then you're able to li lend that book out. Yep. Do you have to keep that license in perpetuity, or are you able to return <laughs> the license? Are you able to give a license for a James Patterson book back and get a license for another book? How does that work? You are buy are you ready to be book. really bored? <laughs> Well, after I read uh, Nick's report that you're going to send, <laughs> then I'll read that one. So. Um, the landscape is ugly. There are so many different models. Um, we subscribe to two different services. Um, one is Overdrive. The other is Hoopla. The wonderful thing about Hoopla is it's multiple users, and we are charged per checkout. So the nice thing is if they have a popular book that everyone wants, everyone in the town of Enfield could check it out. Um, the problem with that that we ran into very early in the pandemic was everyone did that and the costs went through the roof. Um, and what we had to do is limit the, we, we installed a monthly budget and I think it's, um, maybe $1,400 if I remember off the top of my head. Um, they divide that by the number of days in the month and so you know, say $200 worth of stuff can go out in, uh, that's overestimating it, but you know, when you reach a certain limit per day, basically the tap is shut off and you can't check anything out. Um, so that's one model. With Overdrive, um, it's typically one license, one checkout. So it's, that's much more like a physical book. As far as the models go for that, um, some of them are you, you pay and you have a single license in perpetuity. Some of them at a reduced cost might be you have uh, 52 checkouts and then it is done. Um, there's others that are, you know, less cost, fewer checkouts, and then it goes away. Then we either have to replace that title 
or decide, okay, well, it's not as popular anymore and there's no need to replace it. So okay. there's, there's a slew of different models. Okay, thanks, thank you. Councillor Mangini. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jason, Jason, for your presentation. Um, one question that I have, uh, John uh, actually alluded to this question. I'm an academic tutor at one of our uh, elementary schools, and I find that the library in the school is phenomenal. And I'm just curious as to the relationship between our schools, our public schools, and our central library. I would imagine that you're um, working closely you know, to provide whatever uh, reading materials are necessary, but I'm not sure how that relationship works. Could you um, maybe describe a little bit how that goes on? So are, are you referring to the, the school libraries or just the schools in general? The school libraries. Okay. Um, they, they, they operate quite independently of the the, the Central or Pearl Street Library. Um, you know, if, if we get items that are going to be on the summer reading list for the students, we certainly will purchase extra copies of that. We make sure we have all the nutmeg titles, which are very popular with the, the schools. Um, but I, I think that there are the sort of two different models. Um, I think the school libraries really are there to support the, the academics going on right in the schools. Um, we can certainly supplement that, um, but they're, they, they operate completely independently of one another. All right, thank you. And the reason for my question, we just finished uh, Women's um, History Month in March, and I had the opportunity to speak on some prominent um, women in our history, and the library was, the school library was very, able to provide the materials but i started thinking what happens if um they don't have the material well then again i would have gone to central library but i just thought maybe there should be a relationship between the um schools and the central library we can we can certainly look into that i mean i, I, think I, I don't want to put your staff at um any more uh you know workload but it's just a creative idea that I thought maybe could assist the teachers to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that our collection really acts as a, um, a, a supplement to what they have at the, the school libraries. Our collection is certainly larger. Um, it's got a, a greater breadth, I would think. Um, but we can, we can look into that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Is it okay if I ask one last question? Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you. <laughs> no, um, sorry, it, just very quick. Uh, if you know, if you had uh, a, 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 a large budgetary increase, what would you do with it? What are the, the biggest needs? Um, I've heard space before. I think yeah. when you last presented to the council, that was a big issue. Yeah, I mean, we're we're, we're kind of at capacity at at Central. Um, if there'd be a way to expand out or up, it would be wonderful. Um, you know, there's a lot more we could be doing um, with more space. Um, I, I think I'd mentioned one of the, the great needs we have is for smaller private meeting rooms, something like tutors could use. Um, as sort of a, a stopgap for that, uh, using some of the funds that we got from the state library, we installed a, a private study booth that's soundproof, which is it, it, it's wonderful and it's well utilized, but it's only one space. Um, you know, a, a dedicated uh, story time room would be wonderful. Um, right now we've got the community room and it, it's constant turnover, um, uh, you know, for the staff to set up breakdown uh, for a story time, then do the same for uh, an adult program or a movie that's coming up. Um, it's, it, it's a lot and a dedicated space would be useful. Um, my children's staff would have lots and lots of ideas. Um. <laughs> thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Okay. Next, uh, social services. Good evening, Cindy. Welcome.
So the budget, yeah, the budget. Oh, I've got the control. Um, yes. Even better. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Just a question, and just to the town manager. Yeah. Ellen, do you think it'd be possible to get the presentations in advance? Well, we only have one more, I guess, tomorrow, right? Is there only one more? <clears throat> and yours, too. Uh, <laughs> everybody's been working on theirs right up to the last minute, so okay. I can ask. The chief, I believe, is is done with his, and if it is, I will send it out. I don't want to be difficult. It'd be easier to just kind of make notes mm -hmm. on the relative presentations, but that's fine. We'll we'll struggle to keep our notes straight. <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> hey, thank you, Councillor Santanello. <laughs> Steve is going to be creating ours, so you should talk to him. Just doing that. Okay. I think I'm ready to roll. Okay. All set? Yeah, we're, we're good. Okay, thank you. Good evening. <laughs> Thanks for letting me come and present the budget and talk um, a little bit of budget, and I know that makes sense because it's a budget presentation, but also kind of a catch up with where we left off when I last presented to you in December, January, because so much has changed. I can't do the exact same budget presentation that other departments can do because things have changed. So we'll talk about that. Um, okay, this is where we left off. Can you see behind me? Or, oh, it's up there. Yeah. Good. Thank you. We're good. Okay. With, where we left off was with the current structure back in essentially December, January. And it's reflected by the white boxes that were the design in last year's budget book. Now, the proposed structure, which is now um, in place, reduced it down to five divisions. And we were successful at increasing services, efficiencies, reducing management, and it was cost neutral. And I am happy to say it continues to be cost neutral um, into FY23 with a couple items. Um, this is the current structure now. So the comparison I can give you is our overall department um, budget was the 6.411. This year it's the 6.7. General fund contribution is 2.671 last year, or actually current year, going up to 2796. Um, the difference is $124,885, and this shows you why the differences occur. There was one staff person that um, upped to a family plan. The cost of fuel, we have a um, higher amount instead of two 233 a gallon, it's 350 a gallon times 23,000 gallons for our um, magic carpet. Food increase, the food increase for both our early childhood program at Stowe, feeding the 200 kids. We do get money from the Board of Ed for the Head Start children, so that offsets the increase on food, thankfully, and also included in the food increases for the Mark Twain Congregate Living Program, where we feed the senior citizens hot meals freshly cooked on weekends. Um, so the food cost going up there. Minimum wage adjustments, that's largely in our early childhood center with our teacher assistants. Some of you may recall last year we had to come to council to increase our uh, teacher assistants, teacher aides, um, to become essentially more competitive and move us closer to the mandatory minimum wage increase. This then brings us fully to the two increases scheduled July 1 and June 1, I think. Um, so that's that amount. And then we did have a new contract with the Teamsters for our transportation department. This reflects the, there was like a significant increase to um, salaries, which was uh, well needed. And we've been able to recruit drivers and we aren't struggling like we were during COVID. So that total amount is the increase that you see in our budget and by our, in the general fund um, piece of the pie. So there's that. Another thing just to understand about our department, lar almost 60% uh, comes from grants and fees and donations, and then roughly 40, 41 from the general fund. That's the budget part of my presentation. And again, I, I can't go line by line because um, of the change in structure, moving people into the right places. Um, I do wanna give a shout out to John and Greg who worked over 
over time, um, helping get this ready into this new format. So I can't thank them enough. Um, okay. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is based on the reorganization, just kind of a um, hit on some of the highlights and things that have been put in place and also where we're headed. We're talking two things. We, we relocated. We took two divisions when it used to be the, the separated divisions. And we relocated those two divisions. One was youth services proper over at La Magna. One was adult and community services at 110 High Street. We came together in relocation, and that happened in December into January. And it was, it was in steps. Um, prior to relocation, we did co-location team building meetings for about two months. So that by the time we walked in the door, moved from dating to living together, everybody knew each other. Um, so, so there's that part. And then in amongst all of that was the strategic planning process that then led to the reorganization, which was recommendation number one. Now we're going to be operating on implementing the other recommendations. Here is our, there's a couple, several of the people that came together from our divisions uniting, right? And that, that the language there is purposeful. We really have come together, the two um, groups that were in the separate locations. The other location of our department is obviously at Stowe, and then Family Resource Center at Barnard. We've got Transportation uh, uh, Senior Center, and then we do the congregate meal program at Mark Twain. So we're still a little spread, but we've got more of us together. And our nice sign. Um, Alcorn is now where the youth center is. So it, I don't know if any of you saw it when it was at La Magna. Um, it, it was a little bit darker, um, and it was up on the second floor. This is, it, this is a bigger space. It's got all of the glass in the front, um, and this is current, right? So we've got kids coming to play basketball, play pool, do arts and crafts stuff. Um, we are working to grow the membership. So COVID impacted membership. We went from I would say roughly 80 kid enrollment down to zero. And so now we're slowly increasing. I believe in the last week we have 14 new members. Um, so we've, we've blasted out flyers to the, through the schools. Um, we're working on our social media, pushing out. We're working with the community police officers to be able to identify which homes can we go to in Thompsonville, um, going door to door to outreach and invite kids in. Um, we're also working part of the reorganization that was very deliberate was Karen Edelson becoming that senior operations manager. Now, in addition to overseeing the Early Childhood Center, which she's done successfully for 20 plus years, she now oversees our youth center and our congregate meal program and transportation. She has um, made the, she's already making inroads into bringing the after school program at Stowe over to our youth center to start to make that transition for families, raise their awareness that the youth center exists, um, and make it personable. So adding pictures of our youth center staff to the orientation packet when people sign up for school age programming at ECDC. So things like that um, are already in play. We are also, um, town manager suggested, and we're very excited about using the gym space, because it's not used except for the hours that the kids play ball, um, we're going to host a dance. So for fifth graders, we're going to host a dance for any, you know, any fifth grader in the community. Um, and so that's going to happen on April 29th. We're getting ready to push out the, uh, the invite, so it hasn't been posted yet. Um, one of our community police officers happens to be a DJ, so he's going to DJ it for us. We'll sell candy bars. We'll open up the youth center so that the kids can go from the dance area into youth center, get comfortable in the space, see what it's like. So um, all of those efforts to grow the um, membership and activity level. We even, I just told um, Ellen yesterday, we actually had a parent who asked us, because she has a fifth grader, and they're, during the spring break, they're going to go on a field trip to the youth center. And one of the parents asked if we um, rented out the gym at all for activities. So I think the sky's the limit now that we're in this space. So there's a highlight of relocation with a little reorganization as well. 
Um, the reorganization led to efficiencies. The, the simplest one I can touch on is um, our front office. I, instead of secretaries in separate locations with separate orders and separate everything, they're now sitting next to each other in our reception, um, be able to share handling, answering the door, because now we have the buzzer system, um, ordering. We have a, we have a pretty um, well-stocked supply closet because we took the two buildings and combined them. So we have efficiencies there as well. I have coverage now without having to pull a direct service staff to cover reception because of the two co-located. So things like that we're, we're experiencing as part of the co-location or the relocation. Then we shift into, so we're talking relocation, reorganization. The reorganization was informed by the strategic plan and the elements of the strategic plan for us moving forward were adopting the trauma-informed intergenerational approach to all of the work that we do. Um, and in between, purposely sandwiched in between, is this notion of innovation. And so how do we, how do we innovate with this new focus and the fact that we're co-located and we have this new structure? Intergenerational, I just wanted to share, this, these are our kids from ECDC and they're doing placemats that are going to be delivered to our seniors over at Mark Twain. So little things like that we're going to be, we're starting to do very deliberately, whereas before it would be two separate things. Um, so we're excited about the intergenerational approach. The intergenerational approach is not just around um, program and activity, it's also around community initiative work. So how do we make sure that we're expanding our scope um, and doing it in a more efficient way with more direct service and less management. Another area of innovation for us are these two pieces, crisis response and co-response. They're two different things, but they can go together. I will say if I had more time, I would have put a picture of Enfield Police in us, but you get the idea. So crisis response, as you all know, we recently lost the 11-year-old girl, or four times 14-year-old. Um, our clinical care coordinator, Jennifer, uh, Joanna Fornwalt, who has been a social worker with youth services for about six years, is now through the reorganization our clinical care coordinator, and we took all the social workers that were spread across the department, not necessarily working together, um, all under her supervisory direction. Joanna is an, a licensed clinical social worker, um, and she also as part of running the, the social work team and our caseworker as part of that, she has led and recently kicked into gear around crisis response. Um, she co-led co with Sandy Ingalls from the school system. And for about two weeks, she has been working almost all of her hours in response to that situation. She's been in the school, she's been leading groups, she went to the home of the family, she rode the bus with the kids to the funeral, she attended the funeral. So our crisis response is, is I think, far above other communities. What we are going to be doing deliberately is expanding what has been a crisis response focused in on youth and making sure that we have a community co uh, crisis response that is across age cohorts for any untimely death. That can happen at all ages. So Joanne is already working on building out her crisis response team by including community members um, from different organizations outside of town and school. So it's really broadening our scope. The co-response, again, we're talking innovation here, and the co-response is with so, uh, law enforcement and social work. Um, Chief Fox and I have been collaborating deliberately since June of 2020 and designing a co-response model. At that time, I was able to carve out a little bit of hours for one of our social work staff to be outposted at PD so that when there was a need, it was kind of an immediate response internally and externally. It's not always about jumping in the cruiser and going to a scene. Um, obviously, our police would de-escalate. They would make the scene safe before our social work staff would ever enter into a crisis situation. Um, but it's a lot around co-responding when somebody, an officer goes on a call and they fill out a, a protective custody and then they have to move on to the next call. 
our social work staff then can take that the next day, do the outreach and follow up with the person involved or even bystanders. So that's the model that we're using. Um, we are connected to a national network. It started about a year ago and there were probably 10 of us. Um, now that, that national network is growing and we will be utilizing um, social work interns in the fall to be able to build their ability to do a co-responding police social work um, approach. So we're going to be innovating with a broad um, internship program, one piece of it around the police social work. All right, so now we're at life after COVID, right? And so how do we handle the, the, I mean, it's still here, but the effects we know are gonna be long lasting. So we're really talking again about um, mental health and wellness, substance misuse, really looking at how can we combine, we've had the Enfield Together Coalition that's been funded by Drug Free Community Grant for 10 years, we're in the 10th year, we will be able to expand, expand into an 11th year, but we need to update our budget, we need to update our action plan. Part of Enfield Together Coalition work over the years has been a student survey. The student survey done um, in middle school and high school in partnership with the school system because to get into a school system and be allowed to do a student survey is huge. Um, and so they've been a great partner in allowing that. So we have several now, three, four, maybe five of these student surveys. The most recent one was completed in November 2021 and the evaluator who's been working with ETC for many years, she is going to lead two work group sessions to review the student data around substance misuse, parent perception, um, and mental health indicators. So in the student surveys have been mental health indicators around anxiety and depression, thoughts about self-harm, um, but as a community, we didn't dive into those indicators now with life after COVID, we absolutely need to dive into those. So that's really the purpose behind the, the set of work group meetings that are coming up. We've invited a diverse audience of folks to take um, um, part in that. And it's an opportunity now to almost, um, I don't know how, it's, it's still unfolding. So we have our Enfield Together Coalition and there has been in existence a Youth Mental Health and Wellness Council that was a combination of town and board of ed. What we need to do with that, again, is intergenerational. We need to expand it across all age groups. So mental health is impacting everybody of all ages, not just youth. So this opportunity, it's at least a start, look at the student data, but our, um, our uh, the North Central District Health Department um, is providing me with additional data more broadly than the student data. Suicides, um, probably hospitalizations, emergency rooms, those kinds of things, to round out our picture, um, and that's gonna be part of the work group session. So it's not just focused on youth, it's not just the student survey, but it's also the place for us to start because we have to start somewhere, in, and especially in response. Conceptually, an Enfield Mental Health and Wellness Coalition would be ideal. The formation and the structure of that is really, it's not a hierarchy, right? It's not town and board are mandating down. It's really coming up from within our leadership team, which we would want. We want a shared representation with the Board of Education, town council, parent, and then I have work group chairs. The work group chairs are the second tier and they're gonna focus in on, on key areas of focus broadly, right? Healthy is inclusive of mental health. Safe and stable, how, how safe and stable do people feel uh, um, in the community? And then connected to community. Are people connected to their neighborhoods and the larger community? Um, and then again, that outer tier has to always be informed by the community. So this would be the proposed structure of an Enfield Mental Health Wellness, all inclusive, and we don't know yet if the ETC will meld into that or be one of the work groups of it. Um, the ETC is already by federal requirement of the DFC grant. The ETC already has required sector representation. And so we would really wanna also be representative of the different sectors in the community. 
questions. That was a lot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We've been Thank busy. you. I, th that was uh, that was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I, I I have one one question. You know Sir. about the uh, the person that you have the clinical worker that you have Clini working clinical in clinical care coordinator. Yes, the clinical Joanna. Right, uh, but the one that works does she work with the uh, police department? No, we have okay. a, a social service worker, Rena Longley, okay. is currently 14 hours a week at PD. We just hired, and she starts on Monday, um, a full-time um, social worker at PD. Okay, great, because that, that was my, my question. Is there a need for more? Um, so in, in my opinion, now we need to find out with a full-time and a 14-hour and interns in the fall, Yep. I think that's going to be good for a while. Right. One, but with that caveat, we are receiving every day anybody, any um, PCs that happen by officers, we are now receiving those daily. Whereas before, it, there wasn't a system in place for that, and now there is. So what we're going to discover over time, are we able to keep pace with those? And that's where we've been doing it on 14 hours a week for a couple months. And now as we build, how will that full-time person wind up getting filled up? Okay, great. Uh, in, in regard to the uh, internships. Oh, PC, I'm sorry, the protective custody, when they, yeah. when they have to commit somebody against their will to the hospital for usually mental illness. Yeah, okay. Uh, the interns um, yes. from local universities. So Eastern Connecticut State University was the creator of the program. Correct. Um, and then they're partnering with St. Joseph's because the, so the bachelor's level is at Eastern, the master's Ooh. level is at St. Joseph's. Um, I've actually recommended that, and I did tell Chief Fox, I know he's not here, I did tell him, um, I would love for us to be able to teach a course at as Nuntuck to be able to build that theater of associate bachelor masters. And the reason why, it's not easy to find a social worker, a master's prepared um, LMFT, LPC um, uh, person that understands the work of law enforcement and social work. So we need to grow that um, workforce. Mm -hmm. And so this group that started with the professor at Eastern started with the bachelor's level. They've got interns and they're doing their internships at Willimantic PD. You know, our chief talked to their chief right. and. Um, and then when somebody graduated, the first student they had that graduated moved on to St. Joe's. And so, oh, great, there's a master's level to start to really prepare people right. for the work. Yeah, and my, my final question in That's, regard to the internships, um, I know that there are some universities, you know, that they, they place people in, in areas, whether it's uh, insurance, where, wherever, in the medical field, uh, they're compensated uh, something, you know, uh, would that be taken into consideration for these internships, uh, any bit of compensation, or would they just be getting their college credits? They would be getting their college credits. We okay. do not, we have not resourced internships. Okay. Um, and again, this year we're going to have, there has not been a deliberate intern program in the department, and now there is. All right. Um, and so we're going to have interns, not just for the law enforcement, but um, even as Nuntuck has a uh, geriatric um, certificate program, we've got early childhood folks that have interned at ECDC, so we're going to be expanding our intern program. And we have space at Alcorn for two at a time. Yeah, I, you know, this, is, this will, honestly, this will be the last thing that I say. I, no. I think putting this, your uh, social service department over at Alcorn uh, is, fantastic for this community mm -hmm. you know you, you talk about the gymnasium being bright you're talking about uh, doing different things than we've had in the past mm -hmm. you know th these dances are th they're going to be very popular yeah. you know you have to do one for grade five grade six grade seven mm -hmm. grade eight and yep. that would be great for this community great for the kids yeah. um, so thank you Just keep up the the great work thank you yeah. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Um, Thank you. 
first question is, can we have this presentation as soon as possible? I'm asking everybody that, so. Um, and I know we would all like to have it, so when we do our budget deliberations. Um, so non-budget stuff, I, I appreciate that portion of your presentation because it's nice to sort of get an overview of what you've been doing since the since you did come and talk to us about the, or I think the social services subcommittee about the reorg. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to see some of those efficiencies and um, trying to get rid of some duplicity, to be honest. Um, Love the idea of interns. I think we had this conversation last night with DPW that, you know, interns would be great. So any department, if they can follow your lead and partner up with a college or trade school, I think it's a wonderful way to get people experience that they can put on their resume. Um, and there's ways, I believe, for some of these people to even get mileage paid. I don't think it's from the town, but there's other ways for them to do that um, in some instances. So my only question would be, and I love the outreach that you've been doing, and I love that we're focusing some of our efforts on um, social work and in the schools and making sure we have adequate people. Um, well, maybe I have two questions. But Bob did ask if you thought you needed more social workers, and you think right now you, you might be good. I for. Everything that we've just gone through, mm -hmm. I think right now we just need to spend some time okay. doing the work. Perfect. Um, adult daycare. Mm -hmm. So um, I know I did put this as sort of a, a topic we could discuss on ARPA funds, and I know Ellen did respond that I believe you guys had been um, in discussions with um, – all American assisted living that they're going to offer they some sort of me. program with that. Mm -hmm. um, I would love, I don't want to put a lid on Enfield offering a service mm -hmm. um, for adult daycare like we used to have. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not something that Enfield will exclusively offer, I really hope that we figure out how we can partner and make sure anybody in our community. Um, that once a service like that can be led in that direction and make sure that they are taken care of and, and what they need. So, um, like I said, I'd love to have it in Enfield again, mm -hmm. but it's good to know that there are discussions happening with yep. companies that are in this town. And I, I will say that, um, so when the adult day was closed and that's when we were able to create the full-time um, elderly services care coordinator, mm -hmm. because then I could at least reach out to more people than just the people that had been in adult day. Um, and that position has been you know, in place for two years. Um, the calls that we get are largely from, as far as anybody looking for care, it's largely from adult children calling on behalf of their parents and sometimes aunts or somebody that needs some assistance. Um, and, and or we're getting calls from our first responders who are coming across um, hoarding situations, isolated seniors, and, and the like. So it's really not been a press for, I need full time. Mm -hmm. The other part we know is that people are preferring to age in place, and with changes in Medicare, they're able to afford to do that more. Um, with that said, we now also know that we have a new partner coming into town that said that they will expressly provide limited numbers, mm -hmm. but some of the what they're calling respite care and adult care, adult day, so okay. kind of a combination. So I feel comfortable right now that we kind of have a handle on that. I will say a grant proposal that we just submitted today to the NCAAA, North Central Area Aging, and I always forget the last A, um, but we are partnering with the North Central Health District to provide the Gatekeeper Program. The Gatekeeper Program is a community um, education and training program where we identify both traditional and non-traditional folks in community that will be trained on signs and symptoms to look for. If they see somebody that they're worried about, a senior person that they're worried about may have some issues and challenges. For example, a bank teller. They may have a customer that comes in and, all, and, and pretend she's always dressed to the nines, and then all of a sudden she's a little disheveled. She can't remember how to fill out her, her paperwork. 
Um, so we would be training bank tellers and grocery store workers and postal workers, our senior center staff, our, you know, any town staff to be the eyes and ears in the community to identify these folks. They will then funnel them to us. Our elderly services care coordinator will then do the outreach the assessments and screenings for depression, and then some case management until we can connect them with longer term services and supports. So we just applied for that. I don't anticipate a negative response to that. Good. Um, okay. so, so overall, I think we have a nice system Good. Um, for the seniors. Well, okay. I look forward to hearing in the future from you or whoever um, about whatever partnership we do with All American then, because I think that's that's um, outreach that we need to make sure people know about. I, um, just the, I'm, I was with uh, yes, Cindy. you and were in that meeting too. I, I was really impressed. I mean, this is their f sole focus of their existence is doing this, and, and she will collaborate with anyone, meet with any Good. place, any time. Um, they, this is all they do, and they do it very well. Uh, okay. The state of the she showed us the rooms. Um, I think we're all thoroughly impressed with what they do. And she is vested in this exact center. She she used to ro roam around. Now she, she lives in North Granby. She is staying here. She is embedded into the community, and she's doing everything. I mean, she came here at the town hall in a... Uh, Valentine outfit <laughs> and a heart. I mean, she is. She was a leprechaun that day. She is just. She's a lot of energy, and I yeah. and um, I think you guys will be excited if she ever comes and does a presentation or whatever. Um, she also said that her dream was to open up one of these places for um, seniors and have embedded in it a child care center. So I, I was quick to say, well, we happen to have. And so right now, our preschoolers are drawing pictures that are going to get put up on the walls when they open up their center. And we're talking about a grandparent, a foster grandparent program where kids from our youth center can be connected with seniors there. So it's going to be a mm. fabulous partnership. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Councilor Pisner. I always enjoy your presentations. I think you do a great job, and Enfield's very lucky to have you. A um, couple of things. My mom used to be a resident when she, we had her here um, at Mark Twain. And Mark Twain at that time was very lively. It not only had the adult daycare attached to it, but they also had bingo and, and activities, mm -hmm. okay, as a congregate living. So. I actually know some people that are still residing there. And one of the things they always ask me is, isn't there any way we can get some activities here? Because, you know, especially during COVID, it was a long couple of years for these people. Um, so I don't know. I mean, many of them don't drive. I mean, yes, they could go to the senior center or whatever. But at one time, they did have a recreation person go in. Um, I know the girls from Bay Path actually used to go in um, and, and volunteer their time. It was part of their type of, of grade. Um, so I don't know if there's anything your department could do to bring something like that over there. We can talk. Um, we can definitely speak with Michelle Tolo. Is there like um, she works with all the residents? She used to work for us in our food program. So nicely, she works for them now. So I believe that the staff of Mark Twain and the Enfield Housing Authority mm -hmm. that run it used to do all of that, and we did the food part. I will say during COVID, we did have the um, we played a game, and I'm blanking on what it was. One of the TV shows. Family Feud. It was like a Family yeah. Feud thing. So we did, like, trying to think creatively about what can we do to bring some liveliness to it. Um, so we can definitely reach out yeah, and Yeah, just talk like a with, rec director. You know, even I, if, you know, they used to yeah. have the Girl Scouts come in and, and do things. Yeah. And the second thing is I'm very heavily involved in Parkway Pavilion. I still volunteer yes. there. And yeah. they're another source that they're always looking for, you know, children and and elderly okay. and they are really opening back up again yeah. um you know a volunteer bingo or anything like that um i'm a huge advocate for parkway so great um uh, diane sokol would greatly appreciate anything um and and they used to do uh, jfk used to do a senior prom okay. at parkway and okay. it always went over very, very big. Um, you know, they got dressed up, and, and, and it was just a lot of fun. So it might be something with your youth services that could go over and do something like that. But I'm, I am all for bridging the gap between the our, young, our young and our old. I, I think there's nothing better than bridging that gap. Great. So thank Great. you. Great. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ludwig. I'll get to you guys. Oh, 
Thank you. Hey, Cindy, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I don't see Just you. Just curious. But... And, oh, yeah, I hope you're doing well. The, the, you know, the reporting that we started with the uh, last year, you know, with the, uh, through the budget, is there any, anything you've been able to use with this, with the uh, software to start at least forming baselines? Oh, so you're speaking you with start, Apricot. You know, sorry. No, I think you're speaking with the Apricot system. And so, we, so we're going to be yeah. going live. Um, our very first piece of data collection is going to be the dance. And so yeah. we are, that, so we have, the system has been built, tested, and we trained um, management team and then it's set to launch in early April. Is there anything you're focused on initially? Um, initially, I'm going to focus on um, what are the phone calls we're receiving in? What are the right. things that people are calling about? Um, and then any cases that get opened, any referrals made from our uh, first responders. So there's going to be a way they can click on a URL and put referrals right into our system. So really heavily up front around the referrals, how many, what type, what do they need, and then those that become cases, being able to start to look at what are the presenting problems that we're seeing more commonly. Will, will we be able to get like a baseline or a first look in the summer? Um, I would certainly hope so. If we don't, then there's been a problem with the system, and so far it's not. So okay, yeah, I, mean, I imagine I think it's, that. I mean, it's going to actually help. Maybe by September to be to be safe by September. Okay, yeah. I mean having that information is going to really help drive. You're talking about mental health. Yes. A lot of things that you you know you're mentioning. We're actually going to have real time data. Correct. Uh, yes. I, that's, good that's good to see it's up and running. I know it's just, I know it took a little time, but I mean I, I'd love yep. to be able to see when we get a report so that yes. we can start just sort of driving the bus where the community needs it. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mangini. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you, Cindy, for the presentation. Very, very informative. I'm, I'm just very pleased with all the hard work <clears throat> that you and your staff are doing. I'm um, happy to see the partnership forming between the PD and our social services. I think that's, uh, you know, well overdue. I also would, you know, strongly encourage that we work uh, private partnership to uh, form a reopen uh, daycare, adult daycare facility, but also add to the a day, day, daycare um, for um, adults that have special needs. Uh, because I think also, in addition to our adults, um, you know, that have, uh, you know, needs during the day when they're uh, families are away and can't care for them. We do have, um, you know, individuals that have um, needs as well, and they may not be elderly. But I, I would really encourage us to, um, you know, strongly look at the needs of those individuals as well, and um, somehow put together a program that would accommodate all groups of uh, people that, um, you know, have needs and are looking for outlets and care. So I, I just want to bring that forward to make sure we do not overlook any um, groups of individuals. Um, it was you know, not my vote um, to close the adult daycare. And again, I am really um, sorry that that did happen, but I think now we have a good opportunity to move forward, especially with your insight and your thinking out of the box, that maybe we can do something very creative. So I, I want to say thank you on those uh, points. Thank you. And town manager, um, what I'm really excited about is she is very innovative and has been talking with me about the notion about respite, um, how we use our space to at least provide an opportunity. If somebody wants to go out to dinner, can we use our space to care for somebody or you know, kind of supervise somebody? Um, so I, I absolutely agree that we're going to be able to think outside the box. Okay, thank you. Thank you, again. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, thank you so much for presenting this. I learned a lot. I do have a, a number of questions. I think it's probably easier just to go in terms of subject matter, if that's okay. Sure. Sorry to everybody in advance. Um, so uh, do you know how the percentage of the funding streams have changed over the last you know, few years? Has it stayed the same? 
Is it more coming from grants? And what are your thoughts about that? Do we need to be doing anything to hedge against, you know, changes in grant monies? Or, you know, do we think that that's kind of driving the ship here? Maybe we want to do more town funding if the grants are going a particular way. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to know your thoughts on that. So my thoughts are that the grants have been, so factually our grants in the department have been pretty stable, thankfully. Um, and, and we also need to be continuing to look for grant dollars because they do go in waves and they do go in cycles. For example, the drug-free community grant, it's ending its 10-year run, but we also this year applied and received an additional federal grant that's considered an enhancement grant to the drug-free community. That's our CARA grant. It's a smaller amount, but that's a five-year grant. So that as we transition from one into the other and we focus in on the data of things like the student survey, that then positions us. There's another grant that we're expecting to be released from SAMHSA for a partnership, partnership I'm blanking on the other word, but there is another large grant like that, that if we position ourselves well, then that may be something that we are able to segue into in replacement of. Um, I will say for th this year into next year, we've got a good amount of um, some ARPA funds through the Office of Early Childhood and the State Department of Education into our Early Childhood and Family Resource Centers. So that will help as well. And then we're going to find out from all of our data, because data should be driving us around grants. Um, that's, the, that's the wisest way to pursue grant funding, as opposed to apply for a grant because it's got money attached, because then things can go awry. So grants, I, we are in line for grants. We have good grants. We will maintain those and have an eye towards future grants. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, second question here is, um, so with moving to Alcorn, are there any additional uh, needs you guys have for the physical space of Alcorn? I mean, one that I was thinking of the last time I went to the building, it's a, you know, buzzer entry, you have to have a receptionist there, mm -hmm. which I, I know might be a barrier to a, to a kid thinking about going. I'm curious, are there other things that, you know, we can do to make this the most, you know, youth friendly or other program friendly, especially if you're thinking interge interge intergenerational, right. wouldn't want it to be a barrier to seniors either, but what are your thoughts on that? So included in the budget for FY23 is a small amount of money to kind of finish at minimum, uh, to, not to sound froofy, but decorations, right? Like the walls are bare, they're bare brick walls. Um, and so to be able to even have artwork that represents the different you know, generational groups. The other piece that we are working on is signage because we do have people that we do buzz people in, and we've been able to differentiate between buzzing in for us versus people that need to buzz in for uh, Board of Ed up front. So that's worked its way out. But when people come in, even though we have a sign, we have a hanging sign, we have signs on the doors for enter here, people start to wander, and there's no signage. And so we are working on taking care of that. Um, those are the more immediate needs, but I think they're easily figured out. Gotcha. And then uh, lastly, with uh, crisis management, it's really interesting to hear, um, or excuse me, crisis response, not crisis management. Um, interesting to hear about that. So it sounds like our, you know, the social services are mostly set up to do assessment and connection. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, some crisis response is uh, social workers or counselors in the field, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of identifying mental health issues, especially if they know somebody like this is a kid with autism or this is an adult with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're kind of known and are able to be uh, treated most effectively um, mm -hmm. if there's a crisis or, or a law enforcement call. Um, it sounds like less that model. Um, could you talk more about what um, social services does in the police department? It was interesting to hear with the um, uh, people who are being committed, but what other kind of uh, service calls are coming in that you guys are handling there? Um, we handle whether we're at the police department or in our office at Alcorn um, because of the relationships we can respond from wherever we are. And a lot of the times we're getting calls, people struggling with uh, near homelessness or homelessness, um, substance abuse. Um, we get the Narcan save um, referrals come to us so that we follow up with those. Um, and now getting the PCs for people that are actually hospitalized. Um, then we also get, we get a lot of referrals from our EMS and it's usually the people that need that 
extra care. They may need, um, they may, um, we have also helped walk through the process of conservatorship by working with the state DSS. Um, yeah, so it's it's kind of a, you're at, the, the words that I like to use for us are triage, assess, and connect. That's what we do no matter what the location is. And with brief treatment until we can get people connected to longer term supports. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? I, I do have one final comment. Promise. I promise, <laughs> but, but I but but I am very very happy to hear in regard to respite. I'm happy to hear that we're going to be open to uh, helping uh, with adults with uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important for them to be uh, able to go out, uh, give families a break, break, and get together with mm -hmm. typical pe their peers mm -hmm. and to be in their least restrictive environment and mm -hmm. to interact with typical typical peers. Yep. And I think that would be awesome. And, um, you know, that could even turn out to be a regional, you know, okay. uh, get some kids from other uh, mm -hmm. communities to get involved with that. Yep. But I think it's, it's, it's needed in town. Good. All right. And there uh, should and be some grant resources for something very specified. Right, but I am glad to hear that uh, we're moving in that direction. Great. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. I, that's it for me. Okay. So. But thank you very much, Cindy. It was thank you. excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for your support because yeah. it couldn't happen without you. And again, the Newtown manager um, is extremely energized, energetic, innovative, and supportive. So we can't go wrong. No. We know. Thank, we thank know. you very much. We know. Yes, we know. <laughs> we'll take credit for that. Well, no, I'm just kidding. Well, th thank you. Motion, uh, Councillor Finger, second. second. Uh, Deputy second. Mayor Sakala. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.